we we do have uh, two amazing leaders, and uh, but and but before I introduce them, I I want you again. Most of you know this, but not everybody does. That you are in a very special space, and we could not have chosen a better backdrop to to house this conversation. This is also something that did not exist 20 years ago, uh, and this is the as you know the called the Candida Building, which uh, exists thanks to a very generous contribution from the Candida Foundation. But this was a very interesting gift. It was a gift with a condition. It's like, I'm willing to give you this money if you agree to build a sustainable building called a living building. Uh, the problem was that no one had ever built a living building in the Southeast. And some people questioned whether it would be possible because of the hot and humid climate in, in the Southern summers. So of course, we're Jordan Tag, you know, our hashtag, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we took the money and the challenge, and you not only have to build the building, then you have to run it and gather data, improve, among many, many other things, that the building is able to produce more electricity than it consumes, that it processes its own water. I mean, you have to prove that it performs as desired, and of course, we did prove it, and now you're sitting in, in really a, a jewel. There are lots of panels throughout the building. So after, after this, this event, I invite you to walk the building, go upstairs, and read about how this, this building came about. It's, it's really an amazing piece of, of, of design and, and, and a great building. And we organize the classes from every department that are taught in this building, lots of community events, because we want to have people come in and think about what's, uh, what's, what's possible. So I, I think the, the comment that, that uh, energy is important for our future is the understatement of the year. Uh, nothing that we do uh, in our society, nothing that, uh, that we do to improve the human condition, nothing that we do uh, in places like Georgia Tech to invent a better future are possible uh, without appropriate sources of, uh, of energy. Uh, the, the issues and the need for sustainable sources of energy has even been more clear with this new AI revolution, uh, a, 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 an aspect of this revolution, the AI revolution, that I think uh, uh, has become a, a little bit surprised to some, uh, not to everybody, is the fact that these computers, these chips that run uh, machine learning algorithms require a ton of energy and that without energy, there is no AI. And uh, we just don't have enough energy sources to power this, and if we were gonna use all sources of energy, then we're gonna create all sorts of issues like the ones when just described. So there is no future, nothing that we do is possible without solving this issue. Now, come back to Georgia, to Atlanta, to the south, to the southeast, and it's no exaggeration to say that in many ways, the future of energy is being invented in Georgia. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Not only we have one of the highest concentrations, as you've heard from Tim and others, highest concentration of talent, of faculty from all sorts of disciplines focused on, uh, on energy. We have the first nuclear plant that this country has built in over 30 years, right here in Georgia. You're gonna hear about that in a, in, a, in a second. In fact, it's probably the largest source of power in the US. Clean energy power. Clean energy yeah. power in the, in the US. It happened here. That, talk about a big bet, that was a huge bet. We have the biggest manufacturer of solar panels outside of China. Anywhere in the world outside of China, the biggest is right here in Georgia, and you're gonna hear about that uh, also. Um, we also are, are about to become one of the largest producer of electric vehicles, a place where we're developing new, new technologies, but also working with the private sector to invent a, a better future. So um, uh, this was really an incredible vision 20 years ago, but uh, we have our work cut out for us and we, we need to continue this conversation. So. Uh, to help us understand where the future of energy is going, we have two amazing leaders in this space. And uh, first one 
one of the leaders in, in, the, in the Southern company, one of the largest utility companies in the, in the world. These guys have been a little busy over the last uh, few weeks, and I want to thank you on behalf of your millions and millions of customers and people who, who need your work for all the work you're doing to help communities come back and, and reconnect them to, uh, to the grid. So thank you for what you're doing. You might want to start there and give us a little bit of an update of what's happening uh, within your market, and then we can get to talk about the future of energy. Yeah, sure, President Cabrera. I must say that you are a outstanding speaker. So, <laughs> like, I was, like, drawn in while you were talking. So, well, thank you. The coffee is on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to kind of update the audience. So if you can imagine, I know you took us earlier in asking us to close our eyes, but just a week ago, the state of Georgia was faced with a hurricane just kind of barreling down on us. Shortly after that, Georgia Power had 1.3 million customers uh, out of service. I'm happy to report today that 90% of those customers have been who can take power. That power has been restored. We're at 90%, so we have about 90,000 customers still out. Two-thirds of them are in the Augusta area. So what led to this like fast recovery? So there were, I would just say really two things. Uh, number one, we have really invested in technology. So I remember in 2008, Southern Company was one of the first utilities to lead the adoption of AMI meters, where your meter actually tells us if your power is out. So we kind of know almost the same time as you do, but I'm sure as you know it, and recognize it faster than us, that allows us to give you updates in real time. So if you have never done it, you should go to uh, outage.georgiapower.com and you can actually see and you can drill down to see where the outages are, are happening uh, in our state and that's wonderful technology. Uh, we invested in the grid. So the grid is kind of self-healing. If something goes out, the grid is going to try to find a route in order to return your power to you. So that's something that we have investigated, invested highly in. Uh, also, you know, cell service was out, right? And our teams are out there and they're trying to work. We have this interesting technology where we put repeaters on balloons and we fly them above the area so that our crews have access to service so they can communicate. Uh, we also are using drones and helicopters. So Southern Company was the first utility to have an FAA license to investigate the use of drones uh, for our operations. And since this has become standard practice in, it, in the energy industry. So for us as an energy company, we are always looking to do things better and use technology. Well, technology is one thing, but it's really the people on the ground who make the difference. So right now we have 20,000 people kind of focused on the eastern part of the United States trying to get power back to, to folks who, who need it. So right now we have, we believe we'll have 95% of all customers restored by the end of the weekend. Now, we couldn't do this without resources, so I just want to thank our Public Service Commission to make sure that we have the resources that we need so that we can act and get you the power that you need in a, on a quick basis. Fabulous. Thank you so much, and um, thank you for what you're doing again, and, and I know that your, your boss, everybody in the company is really on the front lines dealing with this, so much, much appreciated. We'll get back to you in a second uh, to hear your thoughts about the future of uh, of of the business and energy in general, but I want to ask, you won't go any further. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Murfeld to give us a sense of, I have had the uh, a great privilege of touring the Q-Cells plant. And uh, as soon as you walk into that factory, you feel like you're in the future. I mean, it's an incredibly advanced factory. But um, what, what excites you the most about what, what's happening in the world of solar power, manufacturing, what, what do you see across the horizon? So I think the, um, the thing that excites me the most is probably at the big picture scale, because there's a lot of excitement around solar, justifiably. And I come from a broad background in energy. So I see that there is a, a complete 
patchwork of technologies and, um, and support needed to make the future of our energy transition work. So, but solar stands out to me and it's exciting because it is so, um, it's so able to be distributed. It's the same technology at the large scale as at the small scale. It's inherently getting cheaper day by day. It's the fastest growing energy source on the planet, including here in the US. And actually last year, it was more than 50% of the power capacity installed was solar. That's the first time in 80 years a renewable energy has been more than 50% of what we installed. So this momentum is undeniable. Um, and I would say, before I get to the good news, let me tell you the scary news, is that um, there's a lot of capacity in the world that, that's supporting all of this growth that's coming from one place, China and Southeast Asia, neighbors funded by China. And these companies have been, uh, the, the government has been very, um, transparent and very deliberate in their industrial policy. So this is not a surprise, but it's also put us in a position where we have 80% uh, of the world's modules coming from China, 99% of the world's uh, wafers that's, you know, that are made into cells and modules. And that's not really a sustainable perspective, especially when 50% of our power last year came from this, uh, this, this source of energy. And by 2050, it could be 50% of our energy resource. It doesn't make sense for us to be, for any country to depend, be dependent on any one region or country, whether it's for geopolitical reasons or trade or climate issues. So the thing that excites me the most is how we are sort of addressing that as a nation and as a company in Q-cells. Um, and I was very motivated. I, I've been in Q-cells only about a year and a half, but I was motivated to go to Q-cells from GE because of their ambition and because they had a very specific agenda around creating a um, complete supply chain here in the US from ingots and wafers to cells and modules, and even downstream, because it's nice to pull those things into the market with um, you know, power electronics, trackers, we do development, we've got EPC. So it's, it's this whole system to pull through solar power and make it work in these various energy systems around the country. Um, the thing that excites me most is the practical nuts and bolts of making that happen. So building factories, training people, setting up R&D, thinking about leapfrogging, what is the next technology? Um, it just feels like there's so much momentum there that it's hard to miss because you're in the right, in the flow. So uh, in a minute, I'll, I'll try to ask you, uh, what I will ask you, I'll try to give you as what exactly made and convinced Q-cells to choose uh, this site. But I do know, and I think you were talking to my colleague, Greg King, and many other folks who work in economic development in the state, that a bigger and bigger part of the conversations with companies that are choosing to come to Georgia is, will I have not just the power that I need, will I have the sustainable power that I need to be successful? So it turns out that actually many, many of our conversations end up grounded on, uh, on sources of energy. So um, help us understand some of the thinking around getting the Vogel plan done. Are we, are we, are we there yet? Uh, what else is We are of? definitely there for mm -hmm. sure. So I'll just talk about when I joined the company. So I joined Southern Company in 1996, and I'll never forget one of my first meetings as I went to a plant at Mississippi Power. It was a small facility called uh, Plant Watson. And at the time, it was, a, it was a coal burning facility at the time. And there was this whole discussion about NOx emissions and how to reduce NOx emissions. And I was an energy analyst. And I just remember the engineers at the time saying, hey, we can never do this. Uh, the limit was 0.46 pound per million BTU. Maybe that means something to many of you. I know it does, Tim. <laughs> uh, and I heard people say, hey, we can't do it. And right now in a modern power facility, even a coal facility, NOx emissions are like 0.015. So as technical people, we solve problems. And we have this saying at Southern Company is that we do hard things. So you made a big bet in terms of SEI. We made a big bet called Plant Vogel. And we're really proud that that facility is now completely commercial. So Unit 3 went COD in July 23, and Unit 4 went COD in July of this year. And these facilities will provide power for the next 60 to 80 years for a million Georgians. And so that's really, in, that's really impactful and important to us. You mentioned earlier that it is the largest clean energy facility 
in the United States, and we're proud of that. But Southern Company, we're always thinking about the next big thing. And as a researcher, that's kind of what I do. But I need partners in order to do that. So recently, uh, a few years ago, we did the largest, at the time, hydrogen burn test uh, in the state of Georgia. And I'll never forget when I came to Georgia Tech for the first time, the lab who I went to the first time was Tim's combustion lab. And like, he did it to you, I'm gonna do it to him. Cause he doesn't remember me coming to his lab <laughs> and see like this equipment and the combustion, but investment in science and understanding is what is going to help us solve this problem. But science does not solve itself. It need, these problems don't, you need people and people who have this fundamental understanding. So I'm really proud of this university and what you have done in terms of your big bet, investing in energy. And like you said, energy improves quality of life and people want that. And this relationship between people and energy that I have seen over my career has really changed where energy was once abstract. Now energy is very personable. It's person, like you can make a choice yourself. You don't have to have your power company make your energy choices for you. You can do it yourself. Thank you. So Dr. Burfield, do, do you have solar panels in your house? No, but we just moved to our house. So okay, all right. every time. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so if I would like to have solar panels in my house, is it, is, it, is it worth it? Is it worth the investment? Do you recommend it? Yes. So it, and it, a lot of this depends on what are the incentives that you can get? Uh -huh. What installer can you find to do this work for you? And then what kind of uh, uh, timing, how long do you have to wait? That's probably the biggest issue. Permitting, whether it's a residential rooftop or a utility scale project, um, permitting and poly all the um, uh, red tape that goes around getting a system, that's the most expensive part. All right. So when if I if I keep track of the I've seen those beautiful solar panels that come out of your facility. Yeah. How many of those will end up on somebody's roof and how many of them will end up on a sort of a plant of, um, of photovoltaic? Uh, yeah. That actually the answer to that changes month by month, depending right? on the dynamics in the country. So a year ago, I would have said. 20% uh, of them will go on rooftops, another 10 or 20% of them will go on businesses, and the rest will go on utility scale. Now it's almost all going on to utility scale. There's some residential rooftops, but because inflation or because in, um, interest rates were so high, it really did impede the um, application of these in a you know residential setting. For every 2% of uh, interest, rate. interest rate, it's 20% more project cost. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not kidding when I say the cost of the panels isn't really the big issue here. So, and um, the, we also uh, hear more about, of course, uh, we don't have uh, sunshine 24 hours a day. So the more we rely on, on solar issues of uh, storage of energy become mm -hmm. uh, crucial. Yeah. So do you, do you think we're going to all end up with having pretty massive batteries in our, in our homes or, or are there going to be other forms of uh, storing energy out there? What, what's your, what do you think it's going to be? Yes. Yeah, so the cost of solar is coming down precipitously, but it also so is the cost of storage. And they're both semiconductor-based technology, so they will continue to get cheaper. That's what's driving this. I think um, both of them together are still cheaper than a lot of firmed power that they would compare to. So in the future, yes, I think we'll all have solar on our roofs and a battery somewhere in our, in our vicinity. It might be in our car. It might not be in our garage. Um, but there also will be batteries on the grid. There will also be other forms of energy storage. There will be other forms of power generation. So this doesn't take over. And I don't think the world moves to a completely distributed power system because the really robust, resilient one is some that has central and distributed. But after last week, I was out of power for three days in North Carolina. Now you wish you had I wish I had decentralized. Yeah, I wish I had that <laughs> big battery in my, in my garage. So can I so, make a comment? Oh, totally. In fact, yeah, I was yeah, better. I that was a perfect in. segue to you. I could say here. One thing that we have seen, so we have done at Southern Company, we have done two smart neighborhoods and we're in the process of doing two more. So we did one in the state of Georgia, which I call a kind of a nano grid where you have it solar on your Roof, you have battery in your garage, you have all of these nice appliances that kind of talk to the grid. And as you're driving home, you can kind of tell your house what temperature you want and if you want the lines to open. And what we saw 
was this was a brand new neighborhood where some of these homes, so there were 46 that had this technology and there was others in the neighborhood that did not. The ones that had the technology sold at a premium, right? They sold faster and they sold at a premium. In the state of Alabama, where we did a microgrid, where we had utility scale solar, a battery system, gas backup, and you could isolate the neighborhood, the homes were designed at a higher than building code, that neighborhood sold out very quickly. So I think what I was hinting to earlier is that there is a different relationship between people and their energy. And I think if you were to look at a home 50 years ago, they did have air conditioning. As we build new homes, I think our building stock will change over time and more of these technologies are going to be incorporated. Yep. I think that's what people want. I think they'll always want a connection to the grid. Southern Company and Georgia Power will be there for our customers. But I think the relationship on energy is really changing and evolving over time. I don't necessarily know where it's going to go, but I just feel things have been changing. And, and, your, and your business model is gonna change as well, right? Because I mean, this building, um, I think, Last year may have produced more than twice the energy that it needs. So we're always very happy to sell it back to you if we can. At a discount. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At a discount. <laughs> but if everybody, so, so now everybody is going to have excess energy at the same time, probably at the time where you need it the least. Uh, also, we all need the grid. Uh, and who's going to pay for the grid if we are producing our own energy and, and, and pay the utility less money? I mean, uh, how is, is this going to also radically change the business model? So, the so this is what I think is going to happen. So you have this convergence of communication. You got, you mentioned AI, you got energy infrastructure. So customers are investing capital. They're going to want some type of return, but the utility is going to have to continue to invest in this infrastructure so that we have visibility, controllability of what is going on so that we can balance everything. So, you know, Georgia Power Southern Company is investing in getting those platforms put in place to kind of enable this future that we see that we see coming. I don't know that I see what it's all going to look like. You know, it's kind of cloudy, but I do see things moving in that direction. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least it was yeah. like kind of like a half answer, but I thought. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I appreciate it. If I can add one yeah, other please, thing, though. Please, one, please. So we are um, working with some utilities around the country as well. I can't speak for Southern because this is we mostly are working in California and Texas where the energy markets are quite different. But um, virtual power plants are another example of where the relationship between the utility and the consumer is changing. So when you think about the ability, we offer a, a service essentially where a rooftop owner can participate as a portion of a virtual power plant and they get the same benefits and it creates a benefit to the utility as well in terms of resilience and managing load and demand. And I think that's the piece that we haven't talked about yet, but came up at lunch too, is this is not just about new generation or even storage. The load side is a big part of this new energy solution that in the back, you know, up till now, it's just sort of been, you turn on the light when you want it, you know, everything's they're exactly what you need it. <clears throat> Going forward, it might be a different relationship there as well. Yep, Prince Gabriel, if you don't go, mind me, go right ahead. just one more comment. I think something that doesn't get talked about a lot is kind of the historic kind of residential stock or even the infrastructure that is out there. So how do we think as a country, how are we going to upgrade that infrastructure? So sometimes the least of us are the ones that have this infrastructure. And like, how are we going to transition everything and how long is that going to take? So I did not want to leave this stage by not saying that. That's something that I think about quite a lot. What's the, the curve, the cost curve like of, uh, of solar? We, we heard some oh, yeah. numbers from Wayne going almost like uh, reduced by, by a number by factor of 10. Um, mm -hmm. What's that, that um, uh, first derivative of yeah, well, I, I, it, um, the learning curve is significant. 18% was what people would quote. It's different at panel versus system level, but one, just the point Wayne mentioned, $10 a watt, and that's close to the panel cost. They used to be most of their system cost was the PV panel. Today on the global market, the exchange, the cost for a solar panel is nine and a half cents per watt. 
Now that's, I think, below the actual cost to manufacture it because we have an excess capacity, but that is truly transformational. It's, it's cheaper than building materials, than fencing materials. Throughout Europe, people are using it to line their gardens and hem in uh, livestock because it's cheaper. And now all these little do-it-yourself kits around how do you get energy from your fence. So it's incredible, the change. Now, the, the piece that that doesn't include, though, is transmission, insulation. All those pieces are getting more expensive. Or, or they're aging and they need to be in, you know, improved. That's where the pain is. So um, what do you think? Uh, this is a totally silly question because, of course, you, you, you work for one of these, so you're, you're going to be compromised by, the, by your, uh, your affiliation. affiliation. Yes. But So um, if, you, if you have to invest your savings into and make some bets, financial bets, mm -hmm. into what forms of energy are going to be, are, are going to be the highest growing ones in the future, um, I guess you don't buy wind. Oh, no, I think wind is fantastic. I worked in wind as well. I think it's a great complement to solar because you can actually get more energy at night. It actually has a, a complementary okay. cycle with sun and wind, or even within a region, they're pretty complementary. So wind will be a part too. I think solar will be dominant and it should be because it's the cheapest. So we want more of the cheapest thing. And then it's a question of how do you pack around it to have resiliency and um, essentially power on demand. So I would put, I would say that Solar will be the largest component of the energy solution. It won't make, it won't make the most money for, I mean, you're going to, even if you ran a gas turbine, a very small fraction of what you run it today, you can, you can charge a lot for that power when you run it in the future. So the financial dynamics and the use dynamics are not going to be what they are today in terms of the linearness. The next, so, Barry, I, was, yeah. I was asking, you guys make long-term bets. Yeah, we do so, make long-term bets. So I would say that you need to likely think about energy like you do with your 401k, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about your 401k, what you do is you diversify your portfolio so that you don't necessarily risk up on, on one. So while I am long on renewables, I think that we're going to need a all the above type of strategy. I think long-term, if I had my hundred bucks, and I couldn't split it up. Tim did this to us at the EAB meeting. He wouldn't let us spread our money around. He made us bet on something. I would probably bet on nuclear, kind of in the long term. So I think Gen 3 is what we have right now. Like it's going to be an uh, important tool. I think we'll see that tool used more in the United States. At least that's my hope, whether that's SMRs or Gen 3. But Southern Company is making a long bet on Gen 4 nuclear. And so molten chloride fast reactor. How about those uh, small reactors? Is that a thing? Yeah, I think it is a thing. I know Nicole is here and she'll tell you that she her phone is ringing off the hook talking about small modular reactors. So I do think that we will need a diversity of sources, whether it's nuclear, def most definitely solar. Uh, you know, our state is a big state for, for solar number seven. Uh, but in my mind, I think diversity, diversification a portfolio approach and not just betting on one big, but maybe spreading it around. Gotcha. Well, just a fun fact, especially for uh, younger uh, students, speaking of small nuclear reactors, uh, one of the uh, favorite things that uh, President Clough got to do when he was president, um, he was to actually remove a nuclear reactor that we had right, right here, right? Uh, the nuclear reactor was right here. He used to be. <laughs> So one of the, the first things he had to do was to take that nuclear reactor before the Olympic Games came into town because we didn't think uh, most of the Olympic delegations would appreciate uh, um, <laughs> competing on top of one. But So both of you have doctorates. This is going to get a little more personal than you thought. Mm -hmm. so you, you, both of you got a PhD. Oh it's very important for grad students to know that there's a lot you can do and the world needs lots of good scientists to do lots of things, not just to run labs, but also to be in, um, in, in business. If, um, if you had to do it all over again, what kind of PhD would you get? If I wasn't allowed to get the same one? Well, you can, you can repeat, you can repeat <laughs> if that's... Uh... You want to go first? Oh, I'm, I'm all in on this one. So... <laughs> Dr. Laura Taylor will probably be proud of this. I would want to get a PhD in economics, and I would want to do social-based economics. Mm, nice. That's what I would do. 
and I would go to the University of Chicago. All right. So like I thought about that. <laughs> you almost had her. Almost. You almost, almost. had her. <laughs> And you, and it's you, a joke. You it's ruined joke. it in the it's last a joke, minute, guys. It's a joke. It's a joke. Where else would you get a PhD in economics than in an institute where you're surrounded by amazing science and technology? But if you want to do abstract economics, be my guest. So, how so, about how about you? How yeah. About you? So, um, I I would find it really hard to um, imagine me operating and trying to think about the world of the future of energy without an electrical engineering background. So I'll set that aside and say, I would still want that, but the new um, kind of opportunity that wasn't there 25 years ago when I got my PhD is this idea of engineering systems. And I think electrical engineering is certainly an important part of it, but that's the appreciation that I think we all have now is that there is no such thing as one discipline or domain that can make the chat, that can really drive the solutions that we need going forward and that interdependency of various components of the system or system of systems is fascinating. So that's, that's right. where I would. And you, you, have, you have several students uh, in the audience, and of, this is a little bit of preaching to the fire because the fact that they chose to be here yeah. <laughs> indicates that they have a great interest in, uh, in energy. But what would you, what would you uh, uh, tell these young people that in terms of um, any, any idea that you have on how to orient their their careers given what's happening and how quick and how fast things are changing in the world of energy so my my um advice would be really simple and that is don't try to chart out your path don't try to imagine what your final role will be or even what your next role will be is just really focus on what's exciting to you because it's going to change new the the paradigm around you will change your interests will change and if you've always been sort of um sowing your seeds in the areas that drive your passion, then you'll have enough energy to go through those changes because it's going to take a lot out of you too. The world changes and it throws you for a loop, but um, there's always this exciting opportunity if you're working in something that you're enjoying. Yeah. So when I was in, uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer and I took classes like combustion, thermodynamics, and I was interested in power and it was more brain and ranking cycle type stuff. But the world is just so different now and that you really need exposure to lots of different disciplines and different concepts to work in energy, whether it's computers, AI, like there is so much out there that we need as an industry, right? So I would say diversify your education, take things that are interesting to you. Uh, and I would also say take business classes, Think about entrepreneurship. I think small companies that come up with new interesting ideas, like it's hard to change like the industry from the inside. Sometimes we need people from the outside to change us from the outside in. And I think the entrepreneurs do that. And I think this new generation, they identify with those type of ideals. So I would encourage them to take risks and don't think small, think big and get out there and just make it happen. Terrific, so now that we've given advice to students, how about we give advice to the next president of the United States? What, uh, what mm. would, uh, what? okay, let me make it a little <laughs> bit more abstract <laughs> than that. Oh this is being taped? Now. Yeah, 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 no, no, Wait, what is, really, I mean, obviously energy is one of the most regulated uh, businesses that we deal with, but you know, how can government help? No, seriously, how can government help? So I would say as a representing a company that's regulated, I think carrots are better than sticks and giving companies the opportunity to make choices uh, versus dictating a choice would be something that I would encourage any government official to think about before they set policy. How can you set something that gives us freedom to do things that we have not even thought about? Like don't close the space before it even starts. Thank you. Yeah, and I would say don't be afraid of big carrots. And I, I, of course I am biased because I'm a, com I'm a company that's accepting carrots and we love the taste of carrots. But, um, <laughs> but to, to inject genuinely though, I think there is always this balance that any politician strikes with um, trying to create what is the right mechanisms for enticing the right change. And there's such a confluence of factors between energy and 
our economic growth and our defense and national security, that they got to cast a wider net to think about what, how will this investment pay back? If I encourage these companies to invest in, in manufacturing in the U.S., how is that going to not just help us not be so dependent on a geopolitical rival for this one economic slice, but how is it going to encourage more business growth in other sectors? Or how is it going to reduce our national security risk on this profile? I think the um, invasion of the Ukraine by Russia opened up a lot of mindset about energy policy and national defense. It's like a big picture view that I think any world leader now has to take. So my last question for both of you, same question, very open-ended, but it's been 20 amazing years of the Strategic Energy Institute. Uh, you've been witnesses uh, of, of, of part of that, and we very much appreciate the, the, the relationship we have with you. We know that what we do at Georgia Tech cannot be done if, if, if it's not in great partnership with businesses, with companies that have the tools to, to, to make if you could leave us with, with some thoughts about, um, about the future of energy, some thoughts that might inspire our, our next generation of leaders and faculty members in terms of how can a place like Georgia Tech help? What would that be? And that's your, your, your closing. So I would say for you to focus internally, I think change comes from two things. Number one, the right culture with the right people. So the vision around SEI and what was needed, that was a cultural thing. It was not a thing, right? It was nothing physical. It was an abstract thought. So that set a culture. And then the next thing I heard were the people who existed within that culture. And from those two things, you created success, 20 year success with SEI. So you can't lose focus on those two things. So I would say culture first, people say. And I would say con continuing with the, um, this uh, ability to be a convener and, and a partner to key players in this space, but also don't, um, don't hesitate to be the leader, to be the provocative voice or to be the, um, the, the one who's poking the big bear with the stick and saying, let's talk about this problem or let's convene this group. Even, I would say, student groups reaching out to other student groups, other energy clubs in other places, be the place that people want to come to to have those hard discussions because we're going to be having a lot of them and they're going to happen fast. And it would be great to have a place just within the academic community and within the national community, a place that everyone kind of knows, oh, we can go there. It's trusted. We'll get stuff done. Fabulous. Well, please join me in thanking this amazing <laughs> panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.